So I, um, I appreciate the chance to be with you guys today, and I trust that it'll provide something that's helpful as you contemplate not only the care of people and places that you might serve, but even as you think about what it means to be a pastor in a broader sense of care and how that is woven into preaching, teaching, etc. So, um, titled this, you know, Fostering Hope in the Face of Loss, and uh, Mike Keith, who's here for <coughs> the for chapel today, he and I had lunch, and one of the things we're kind of recognizing, and, and it, it's, not, it's not an attempt, it's not a, a conscious attempt to see grief in everything, but to recognize that really what, we, what we're doing with people, or where people will call out to us for help, is when they're facing life transition stuff. You know, no, none of the people in your congregations are going to call you up and say, you know, my kids have decided they want to go to church more regularly, and we just don't know what to do about that. You know, they're not going to do that. Couples aren't going to say, you know, we're having too much sex, and it's way too good. It's just blowing my mind, and I don't know what to do. They're not going to do that. They're, like, those kinds of things, easy things, good things, nobody calls you about. You don't go to counselors. You don't need help for that, that kind of thing. What we're talking about as we think about our care for people is things of transition where, you know, something is lost, maybe something is gained, but maybe they don't even know what's gained as of yet. And so really is, again, when we're thinking about the, the situations people face in their lives, the, the relationship stuff, the physical health stuff, you know, all the gamut, their own personal histories, they're coming to terms with uh, a reality or a new reality and we're wanting to say, how can we care for them as they carry on with that? So, uh, Andrew, I passed along to Andrew, and I think you guys have the, you know, just kind of PDF of all the slides here. If you want to use them, you can, and, and whatever. But uh, what we're going to do as we, um, we'll have two sessions, or three. So the first one, kind of giving some basics, introduction, to kind of context, concepts. The second one, um, uh, Andrew and his correspondents had mentioned things along traumatic stuff. Uh, so we'll touch on that a little bit. And then the third part will be then thinking about especially the act of pastoral care, the kind of, if you want to say, the methodology behind it and some of the dynamics. So for that part, we're going to push our desks back and kind of sit in a circle and try to make you feel uncomfortable and, and that sort of stuff. We'll, we'll test your social adjustment to that. <laughs> Oh, I didn't actually check to see if this was going to work. Maybe it doesn't like my mouse. Maybe I didn't turn it on. <laughs> yeah, okay. So this was from a, an author writing, because again, as we're thinking about transitions and negative transitions, not positives, we're thinking about darker stuff. So a culture that insists on seeing suffering as a pathology, that is ashamed of suffering as a sign of failure and inadequacy, a culture bent on the quick fix for emotional pain, inevitably de ends up denying both the social and spiritual dimensions of our sorrows. How can we engage with those quote unquote darker emotions in a culture that tends to want to say, don't worry, be happy, or um, uh, with Pharrell's, if you're happy, just you know, clap along if you're happy and all that kind of stuff, or I don't know what other songs I can pick up for that. But um, you know, we tend to feel like a failure if we admit to our world being shaped or rocked in a negative way because we should have somehow been stronger, we should have had the resolve to see it through or, or these kinds of things. We may feel ashamed of what we've experienced and continuing to be touched by it. And again, that's a, that's a cultural thing where we don't experience that with the positive emotions. For those of you who are perhaps married or engaged or seeing somebody, you know, those initial euphoric kind of feelings that you have are culturally acceptable. We're very happy for you to have those. But if you have the associated negative stuff, or a, you know, fitting kind of loss or something like that, those tend not to be welcomed so much. So we're, again, kind of thinking about our, our cultural context in which we do that. So the first point to kind of recognize is grief is anchored in love and not logic, which is to say it's not a cognitive <coughs> process that you're going through. It's about your heart and connection. 
love is not a, a cognitive or a rational experience. Um, the things you do for love are not cognitive and rational, even if they take an act of will at times. And if you don't have kids but intend to, you get to experience that with kids. The things you would do for your kids that are not cognitive or rational, even having kids, totally irrational kind of thing. You'll lose sleep, you'll, they'll cost you an arm and a leg. It's not really worth it from a cognitive, rational thing. Just borrow somebody's for a while, babysit if you feel the need. But um, when we, when we uh, connect it to love, it's more profound than that. It's deeper. I mean, even for us as Christians, we could recognize the, the sacrificial sense of love, which is, again, not rational, not cognitive, not really logical. It transcends that. Um, and so then grief is really kind of a conjoined twin or the other side of the coin to love. Why do we grieve? Because we love. Because we've attached ourselves to people and to things and to stuff like that. <clears throat> there are people who are dying all over the world today, and none of us is all that broken up by it. Because we don't know them and we don't love them. Now, we could ponder some deaths and if we wanted it kind of reflect on the ways in which we, we might be touched by that or feel a, an element of lament, but it's not going to destroy us from doing anything else today. We would recognize that um, it's, there's not, not any kind of real connection there. And so from that angle, you, you were contrasting ways of, of approaching it. So if we look at it as then a medical problem, we're going to look for some sort of treatment, we're gonna seek a cure, we're gonna give you five managed sessions of, of counseling therapy to help work you out of it because we're ashamed of what you're experiencing and we want you to not feel that anymore. But if we see it anchored in love, we'll provide care and facilitate some sort of long-term transformation as you work through that. But we're not gonna end it. If you have a child that has died, we're not going to tell you stop loving that child. Well, grief is anchored in love, and so you'll, you will continue to grieve as long as you love, and we would never invite somebody to stop loving. That is not even just a Christian position, it's sort of basic human kind of uh, thought and reflection. And so loss of, uh, of any kind can give rise to whole, uh, uh, sometimes unpredictable, but always complex array of, if you want to say, brief symptoms, or we could talk about them as signals that are anchored in love. And so we want to give, uh, if you want to say, individualized or a very sensitive kind of approach to what people are experiencing. Uh, a medical approach will seek to kind of figure that out and, and get you out of it, but it's actually selling you a bill of, of goods that it can't fill. because. Again, because it's anchored in love, you can't actually stop the grief. You can't get closure. You can't resolve it. You can't uh, get rid of it. And so all of those types of approaches are going to try to get you to somewhere you can never get. And so we want to um, be alert to that and recognize some of the cultural pressures on those kinds of things. Uh, so just sort of a brief overview of some things that are, these are real big generalizations. They're things that shape our culture and that shape our approaches to, to grief in particular. So a death-free generation, by that I mean people are, are um, sometimes not experiencing a loss in their families until they're in their, say, like 40s, maybe even 50s. Um, and so you might, even as you serve in congregations, have people who are, yeah, in their 40s, maybe even 50s, who are coming because a parent has died and they say, we don't know what to do. Like, well, what do we even do? Or funeral planning, funeral homes. Uh, we've never done this before. And, and that's a real shift in our mortality rate that's happened, you know, in, say about 1900. Usually by the time you're 20, you've attended somewhere around like 50 funerals. The, the number of deaths and the number of younger deaths were just much more frequent. Now, we're very thankful for a healthcare system that gives us the capacity to not always be threatened by that, but we're seeing the consequence of it. People aren't connected with it that closely. You know, we're a mobile, fast-paced culture. We, you know, people when you're in the congregational city, so you've been busy week, and, and just, I dare you to say, no, not busy at all. I'm trying to make sure it was very slow, and see how many times you can get away with that, but uh, you, you need to know them first before you do something. Like that. <laughs> Unless you don't really care whether you get paid or not. Uh, but grief is a slowdown process. 
kind of like love, you know, especially in those euphoric kind of initial times, has you distracted by it. Grief is a, a process that will slow you down, and there's not really a lot of room for that in our, in our particular culture. We're generally disconnected. A massive challenge for North American churches, especially mainline Protestant ones, is trying to get people connected to one another. Highly individualized, highly disconnected, very polite, especially in Canada, but not really very warm and connected. And so when grief fundamentally requires you to slow down and receive support, that becomes a really hard thing to do when we're not connected. Uh, we value self-reliance, we want you to do it yourself, um, you should really be independent and strong and all these kinds of things. And so, again, a mismatch for grief. You know, that sense of avoiding spirituality or religion or spiritualism, we've got on one hand a culture that is, is recognizing more deeply a sense of spirituality, but it's not seen as an acceptable way to kind of work through life problems. It's maybe something you can do with rocks or yoga or you know, and not all yoga is spiritual, but, you know, different practices that people are getting into, but they're not really seen as, like, acceptable ways of, of working through, you know, more serious problems, generally speaking. Um, pain and suffering, kind of like that first quote, is seen as always bad. And so a good reflective point for you, as you even think about this, if you are serving in a congregation where people are in pain, is your first inclination to get people out of pain? If it is, you're going to want to kind of step back a little and kind of do some work on that because uh, pulling people away from their pain, or you could say intervening, is actually not serving to be helpful. A big thing for personal self reflection is are you comfortable with people who are in pain? Big pain, uncontrollable kind of stuff. Uh, emotion phobic, and you now it's usually pretty easy with, say, people who are over 50 to do this, and I don't know, you guys can reflect on it for yourselves. Consistently, generally consistently, you'll see family upbringings, the kind of uh, emotions people are allowed to express. You know, are men in your family allowed to cry? You know, and lots of times not. And, and again, as you guys are a bit younger, you can reflect on, were you allowed to cry? Were you allowed to be happy? Were you allowed to be angry? What about women? Are they allowed to be angry? Is it unbecoming of a woman to be angry? Is it un unbecoming of a man to cry? You know, uh, these kinds of things that are cultural constructs as we think about what people, uh, how they should behave, but Again, it creates a real problem um, when, as a culture, we're really wary of strong emotions. I mean, you just kind of look at our, our, our Lutheran church's piety tends to be very limited in its emotion that you're allowed to express. And so we're not, you know, we're not just not only a not wave your hands, but we typically don't welcome people who are weeping or crying, and we'll try to usher them out and that kind of thing. Or they, they know that they maybe can and so you want to be sensitive to the fact that you know, certain things are welcome or not welcome. Symbolism of death, and this was kind of a movement to the 60s, especially getting rid of things like armbands, wearing black, all this kind of stuff. And what does that do? You could have somebody, even in our room here, who has had a very significant and recent loss, and you would have no idea about it. No clue. There's no, no, no cues, nothing, unless you know the story. And what does that do? Well, it stops us from, from uh, giving special attention to them and giving a little extra care and grace when people need it. And we, we just lose the sensibility to that. Kind of denying our own mortality. There's an element of that. We're confronted by death a lot. Video games, media, everything is filled with death. But yet sometimes it's kind of seen as a distant thing or you know, people say, if I die. Well, aside from that Jewish guy, a little while ago, everybody who dies stays dead, and it happens to everybody. Mortality rate is right around 100%. And so you're pretty, pretty solidly reliable you're going to. Uh, devaluing life in this sense, when we have no capacity to confront death, we lose the capacity to value life. Uh, Luther himself even talked about stay close, as close to death as you can, but not too close. <laughs> because you know what? It starts to remind you 
what, what do I really value in life? What do I really want my life to be about? Because there's a lot of crap you can fill it up with, but what's actually important? Who's really important? And so there's that, that sense of, you know, we, we lose a value on life when we kind of disregard death. All right, so we'll, we'll cover some misconceptions sort of uh, briefly, and then we'll um, work through some of these. And then we'll pause for some, let me see, let me, yeah, some question or reflections after this. So I've got five. You can get a more detailed list in uh, some of Wolfgang's work. Um, I'm just going to write these up here <coughs> so that you can kind of have them accessible in your visual field as we carry on. So bereavement is to be torn apart, just sort of the objective state of losing something. Happens at death, a life is torn away from you, but what are some other things that you guys can think of that get torn away from us? That can be. You were going to think about losses people experience. I think neither can be lost because it generally seems a positive thing, but when someone gets married, there is while you're gaining something, there's also a tremendous loss of yeah. who you are as an individual. And okay. And, uh, so, uh, so for the person, they get a, <coughs> a loss of you're not single, you're married kind of thing? Well, yeah, and, and so. just, it, you know, you're now, I don't know, there's always someone else to keep in mind that always, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. you're not yourself anymore, you're not your own thing, yeah. you can't spend your money however you want. You, can't, you know, just, yeah. you're so, like, all the autonomy, I guess, in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a sense of uh, uh, working through that we're making a commitment to somebody else whose life will affect ours that we can't. That has not, is, it's not really about your capacity. You can, you have the capacity to sleep around with whoever you want, but you're choosing not to. And so it's not an, a, an issue of like capacity, but willpower and when it comes to a lot of other things too. Yeah, the parents will sometimes talk about that too child gets married and now they're, they've moved away from home now if they haven't already or something like that. But uh, what else? What are some other things? Like? Particularly if older people lose the ability to drive. And they've, yeah. They've lost their independence. Yeah. Independence goes with driving capacity. I mean, what are some other things? You can just shut them out. Just distance. Okay. Um, so losing people go to distance for travel or work if they move across the country. Yeah. Yeah. You can lose relationships by yeah. moving. In our experience going overseas, we were shocked at how much grief and mourning yeah. was involved. Not just for us, but even for our families. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's hard. Well, so sometimes how work, yeah. if you lose a job, you lose that community, you lose financial stability, you lose your sense of purpose. Yes, yeah, huge stuff. And recognizing work can be lost voluntarily or involuntarily. Mm -hmm. Some of those similar things are experienced, whether retirement or laid off or fired or disability leave or these kinds of things, so there's job losses. What else? Giving up a child for adoption. Okay, giving up a child for adoption. Even if you had no intention of keeping the child in the mm -hmm. first place. Um, I had a friend who went through it and she was told by her counselor, like you get the same symptoms whether you put your child up for adoption or if you get an abortion. Mm -hmm. It's a lot yeah. of the same stuff. You're, you're, it, you know, and there again, it's, it's something that you're choosing, but you still face the, the consequence of that. What are some other ones? What else, what are the things that you value in your life that you would not like to lose? Could be a family heirloom if you lost. Yeah. So wh why would that, wh why would that be important? Because uh, there's kind of stories behind that and uh, an, an emotional attachment to yeah. the object. Yeah, it connects, it, it connects you to a past. And part of who you are is connected with that, and it's not about the thing and whatever it's made out of. It could be a trinket worth nothing, but it has a connection that teaches you about yourself. What else? What else would you do you value that it would be a hard to lose? For myself, um, information. Okay. Um, one time I, uh, object twice, I lost a computer and then it had a whole bunch of save files, not necessarily for work or anything, but just things that I've been re uh, writing down and working mm -hmm. on, and that was Yeah, gone. there you go. So, I was hard. thinking about it. What if we just took away all the laptops in here? Uh, there would be all kinds of 
grief and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> From a lot of different <laughs> angles. <laughs> especially <laughs> when we <laughs> Yeah, especially depending when those papers are due and all that yeah. stuff. So yeah. yeah. So you know, thinking about it, what are the things we value? And sometimes in the Christian church we can kind of shame people for valuing things. You know, well you should only love God or people well he says don't just don't love things ahead of me. You know, but we still have attachments to stuff, whether for emotional connections or like it's okay to love your house. You love and you love it not because you particularly like lumber or drywall or flooring, but because of the things that happen there. It's an important place. Or what about pets? Yeah. You, you love your pets? You'd be kind of heartbroken if they died. And, and you know, and getting to, to re re reflect on that, and, and getting to affirm that these things can happen. So bereavement is just then the just the objective loss that you experience. Grief is the whole range of internal responses to that loss, and it affects all of who you are. Uh, your cognitive, your emotional, your social, your spiritual, and your physical. All five realms are touched by that grief. Now the intent. We'll talk about some of the shapers of our grief, but. Um, so the intensity is not always the same, but it affects all of who we are. You don't get to isolate. It's not just your emotional <laughs> self that's affected. Uh, it's not just your uh, social self or whatever, but, and your spiritual self gets tied up in all of that. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Mourning then is when you take that stuff that's on the inside and give it expression. It's sometimes talking about the shared social response to loss or grief gone public. And the only way for us to, if you want to say, heal from our grief or to find uh, a renewed sense of meaning and purpose in life is to have a shared social response, to have a safe place where we can talk to people and give expression to it. And so this ends up being what is our primary task for helping the bereaved or those who are facing life transitions, creating a social context where they can give expression to that. And that's where we take that inside stuff, we're allowed to let it out, we're allowed to talk about it, we're allowed to reflect on it, and knowing that it takes somebody else to help me get there. And then we'll, again, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more as we, we go on. Um, now, uh, maybe we kind of already touched on these, but you can think about, yeah, you know, the things that we lose in these, um, you know, you can have these deaths, that are then lost of a person, but then you can think of the secondary losses that go with it. Scott mentioned them with the uh, with job loss. What goes? Sense of purpose, financial security. Oh, and then well, you mentioned the, something the else. relationships in the world. Relationships, workplace. yeah, because you never, as much as everybody says, we'll stay in touch. You never do, because you're because it was always dependent on being there and being in the same place. And so you have your primary loss, and then the secondary or the fallout stuff. Uh, when, when couples get divorced, lots of times they're happy to not be married to the person, but then they are saddened at the loss of a future. Growing old together, traveling, you know, the financial security, having a place where the kids could come home to and not having to like juggle them every year or uh, whatever weekend, stuff like that. You know, all those losses that are tied into their hopes and dreams for, for that marriage. So, you know, job, homes can be kind of, a, as, as we mentioned with the moving, homes can be lost voluntarily or involuntarily. And so you can move, or like our friends in Fort McMurray, you can have your, that was an involuntary loss of your home and your community. Um, stuff around family violence and assault, sexual assault, theft, fraud, robbery, you know, what do you lose in situations like that? Maybe your sense of safety. Same with uh, types, different types of assault. A uh, sense of self, a sense of wholeness. You know, things that you value that are beyond just a physical or material kind of thing. Um, a motor vehicle collision where you can have a, a death, but you also then lose the sense of, of safety. One of the kids in our uh, Christian school program, him and his dad were in a car accident in January, and so now, now that he's in grade four, uh, they were going to see a, a counselor because he's still having anxiety about driving in the car, especially if they go around the intersection where it happened. Well, quite naturally, you used to think you were safe. You were in the car with dad, you'd be fine, and you naturally learned that because you'd been in the car a million other times, and every other time it went fine. But now you're realizing, oh, that can happen. 
And what's going to stop it from happening again? Nothing. Probabilities are not sufficient. You realize if it happened once, it can happen again. So we, so things of safety, self, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, meaning, self, security, and you know, security, physical, emotional, financial, your sense of self, self identity, your self confidence, your health, your personality, and meaning, goals and dreams, faith, your will, desire, or desire to live, joy, all those can disappear very right? quickly. Uh, so if you had the misfortune of learning about the stages of grief, you can just kind of take that, like in Harry Potter, and use your wand, and put it somewhere else, and forget about it. Um, but what, what were the stages of grief? You worked through them, and, and that was some of it was a misappropriation of this is Kubler Ross's work in the '60s, and and while she was very helpful in being part of the group of people who were initiating a more academic or helpful study of what it means to, to experience loss. Um, it, it wasn't helpful in the end. It appealed to our North American sensibilities, though, because it was linear and predictable. And we like things that are linear and predictable. And we don't like disorder or unpredictability. And that's, again, part of our cultural context in which we minister and serve people who don't like unpredictability, but would like things orderly. And so, you know, all that stuff, it just, it, 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 it was, well, A, it was, it was effective only, so just emotional side without acknowledging the sense of spiritual, social, physical, and cognitive shape. It was a very limited range of emotionality. And then it encouraged people to think in that sort of linear pattern. Well, then I'm 60% done my grief, and well, t only 40% more, and we'll be moving to it. Uh, the sense that you should move away from it, not towards it. So this goes back to that point again. Are you comfortable with darker emotions? Because if you're not, you're going to encourage people to step away from their grief. But really, again, going back to if you want to mourn it authentically, you need to be able to give expression to it. And that's surrendering to it. That's giving expression to all the things that are going on that maybe we can't even make sense of and that don't need to be made sense of, but can be overwhelming, can make us feel uncomfortable, uh, but allowing room for that to happen. And so um, encouraging, again, that, that's sort of like an intervention sense. Intervene to come between. If you, if you want to intervene and keep people and their grief separate, well, then that'll help keep them away from their grief and make you feel OK, but it's not really helping them. Tears are only a sign of weakness, again, going back. What's your, what's your family upbringing? What were you taught? Of, what were you guys taught about? Men and crime. What were some of the things in your families? Okay, not okay, or you never heard anything? Never heard, never heard anything. Never. never. What happens when? What happened when? Did you see Dad cry? Ever? Once. 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 And then what did he do? What was it like when, when that happened? <coughs> It was a very uncomfortable experience. Oh, ah, okay. So that, that's good because that's teaching us what were the the rule wasn't expressed. Usually those rules are not written down on a piece yeah. of paper, but underlying was this isn't the right way to know dad. Yeah. This is not the thing. So uncomfortable. What about for you? Uh, I don't know if it was uncomfortable, but it was bizarre. I guess. It was, mm -hmm. Hey, that's the moment. I guess that I knew that. It was like a serious. Yeah, yeah. Something. This is way out of the norm. Yeah, yeah. What, what about the rest of you? What were you talking about, men and crying? Nothing, but actually, when uh, my grandmother died, my dad's mom, I remember the entire time I thought it was weird that he didn't cry. Because mm. I could tell that something was going on, but I, he never really let it out. So, with that, I was concerned. Yeah. <coughs> and, that, and that's. You know, there again, we don't teach the rules, you know, in a, again, writing them down in a list, but we communicate them by saying, are you welcome to cry? Do you just do it? I mean, it's a natural, kind of good, human, healthy thing to do, you know, at, at special times. And so, yeah, are you given the freedom to do that? And so then we think about who are the men we've ever seen cry? And if you can't think of any, then you've picked up a, a rule, men don't cry, too much weakness, that kind of thing. So especially if you're serving in a rural farm setting in you know, Alberta or Saskatchewan, 
generally speaking, when men are tough, what's going to be the rule? And some of you guys who have gone on vicarage might have experienced that. Don't cry. You got to be strong. Be strong. Uh, after somebody you love dies, the goal should be to get over your grief as soon as possible. From what you've picked up so far, what's the challenge with that? You can't control how long it'll take you to get over it. Okay. Uh, if, if, if getting over it's even a thing you're trying to do. Yeah. Uh, somebody wanting to. So, the mentality of, I don't want to get over this person because I still love this person. Yeah. And I have to come to terms with the fact that we're parted, but I don't want to get over. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, it's anchored in love. You're not going to stop loving that child, that parent, that spouse, you know, whoever, the pet, that kind of thing. Good. We're, we're making great progress. Uh, all right. So what can we expect? Here's just a few things. Uh, well, that's meant to have a grieve in there. I was, I was having a little bit of cold, maybe not totally together, but... You will grieve, but you must choose consciously to mourn. So you will naturally grieve, and you'll have that response, but the only way to give it expression is by consciously choosing to mourn. It's an act of will. Um, you'll have a whole variety of thoughts and feelings. You will need to feel it to heal it. And so it kind of sounds a little silly, but uh, the only way to uh, kind of, if you want to say, heal the intensity of the pain, the struggle, is actually experiencing it, entering into that pain, going to the places that hurt. Um, you can, you won't get over, as we were just saying, but you can learn to live with it, um, and you can befriend it, so that when those grief bursts happen later on, and you're in the grocery aisle, or you hear that song that goes on, it's not a point of shame, but you can enter into the pain of that loss, and, and remember, and then be able to carry on. You can welcome it as a friend. It's like the person saying, don't forget me, don't forget me. It's a, some, some people, as they move along, they look forward to those three parts. You're going to need help for others. It's a communal thing. And again, hard to do in our culture, where we're encouraged to be very separate and independent from people. And maybe don't let a lot of people in. Um, and you're not always going to feel that bad. Again, as we give authentic expression to it, the intensity, to talk about it in that way, uh, goes down. And that's not a getting over or getting closure, but the intensity of the pain will slowly diminish. It doesn't go away completely, but again, it's not, it's not as constantly there as, as initially. All right, well, we'll pause here for any questions or reflections or comments you might have. This is slightly, well, I've heard some teaching before on the Beatitude that blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted on this kind of an idea where simply being sad does not get you necessarily on the healing process, mm -hmm. but it's at, there has to be some degree of expression yeah. of that inner reality. Yeah. Otherwise it just kind of festers. Yeah, you just, you hold it. And you, I've got, there's a slide on carry grief later on in and the effects of that, but uh, yeah, if you can give expression to that, if you can, especially you think about what does it take for a pastor in a congregation to give freedom for people to mourn authentically and you know, give expression to all the things that are going on. Um, you mentioned earlier about symbols of grief, like how we used to dress in all black mm -hmm. or wear bands or whatever. Would there be, in your opinion, a benefit or a help to create a mourning culture within our church communities, like a yeah. way a way for people to have and express those symbols of grief mm -hmm. in a sure. public way. Yeah, absolutely. As soon as you know, even as you say, to express it in a public way, you're inviting a shared response, mm -hmm. and you're inviting other people to give to acknowledge that. And so, I mean, if there's a way of doing that, or if you can get people to buy into that, mm -hmm. then yeah, absolutely. I'm thinking about a question that will come up in Lutheran circles in particular. I think you were hinting at this at one point, that even in Luther's writings on what we would call grief, there's this concern of, well, you can feel it, but don't go too deep into it, because then you might lose your faith. 
Mm -hmm. And as you were saying, that grief takes you into the land of dark emotions, and in the depth of it, you feel like there's no way out. Mm -hmm. um, would you be able to speak to that concern? Because I think it's a fair one, but my sense is it's still helpful to go through yeah. the process of starting to this. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, there's a level where we want to be careful with where people are at, and sometimes you need to time it and pace it very slowly. So if people have pre-existing conditions of clinical depression, you're going to have to go very slow with them because they are not going to be people who can go too deeply into it without being potentially overwhelmed by it. Uh, previous anxiety kind of stuff, uh, people that will have to go very slow. We had a lady and I did a fall grief group. She had got in touch, she had just moved back to Airdrie. Her husband and two boys were killed in a car crash uh, in the spring. And the boys were like two, it was just before this, the, he was about to turn two, like two weeks later, and I think four or three or something like that. Anyways, she had anxiety issues uh, that she had already struggled with. She had never actually let the dad go out on his own with the kids. They're almost four. So, I mean, you're, you're queuing in. This was the first time she let him out with them. And then this happens. Anxiety issues, she comes to our group, she had missed the first couple of sessions, and then after three, she ends up having a seizure in our group session. So it was a very unusual kind of session. Um, uh, but she had, she had mentioned it before, so we were okay with that. But she had actually gone into essentially like a shock kind of coma for like a week after the husband and kids died. Because like her body just couldn't, it was protecting her from being able to handle all that. So that teaches us, yes, in some cases, we need to be very careful of going very slow. The issue of losing faith, I, don't, I think I would need to you know, look at that more. I would initially go to that as a projection onto people and um, connect it a little bit this way. If you have this goal in mind, or trying to push in these things for people to have some sort of positive view of God, you are not giving them room to be honest with you or with themselves. And so what what that what does that really create? Inauthenticity, you're just lying about what's really going on, and you're not you're not even, if you want to say it, not even being biblical. What did the Psalms say? Hey, what are you doing? Are you going to do anything or not? Because it sure looks like you're not. Uh, you know, those kinds of things. Giving honest expression to that, because even that's an act of faith. And so, we will, if we approach it with, okay, whatever happens, we need to project, make sure that faith is maintained. Um, we are coming in preloaded and not really being truly present to a person unconditionally. Um, and, and so then that, then that says, well, we're going to try to reframe everything in some sort of positive light or, or this kind of stuff, which ends up causing more harm than it does good. Um, what perhaps, and, th and this becomes another place for self-reflection, what if that person does turn away? Can you be comfortable with that? Because they have the right to do that. They have the right to reject God. And it's tragic, and we don't want to see it, but they have the right to do it. And if you want to take a heavy-handed approach and make sure that they stay in, then that, it just, we, we, we you know, in, in any other case, we just talk about that as abuse. We're trying to control that. And so there is a place where people can have, you know, giving them the freedom to have to wrestle with that from this place. You're responsible to them, not for them. They are on their own spiritual journey of coming to terms with what it means. And, and maybe that's informed by all the bad theology they got. 
well, God will keep you safe if you're a Christian, or nothing, he won't let anything bad happen, or he won't give you more you can handle, or, you know, all those kind of sayings that are out there. Um, and sometimes that means that you might not be able to prevent them from turning away from God, maybe at that moment, or maybe permanently. And so that's a place of reflection. But, if I can put it in this light, if you can give them room to at least be honest about that, you allow the conversation to continue. Because maybe in that, in that moment of crisis, it's not the time for the Bible study. But maybe down the road it is. Because they're still reflecting on that. And they're feeling the grief of losing the God they thought they had. And maybe that's not the true God. And okay, fine. But let's say, how can we, how can we work through that? Getting to be the kind of person who allows them to be angry at God is fine. Is it, or, pardon me. Getting to be the person who allows them to be angry at God is helpful and healing. We had ten people in our group. Four of them said straight up and openly, you know, I used to, but now that, I, now that this has happened, not anymore. I don't like him. I'm not going to believe in him. And, you know, if, if he was there, he wouldn't have let my... My husband, my sister, my sister-in-law, and then one lady, she had four people who had died in a relatively short period of time. And so, you know, uh, she had, she had then was very open, and a few people were then very open about saying, yeah, I used to, but not anymore, I don't believe in this God. Or I, or I maybe not believe in, or I'm not interested in pursuing or following or, or whatever else, on account of their experiences. But they were then welcome to share that in our group. They weren't ashamed for that, because that was just being honest about where they are. And so, again, this becomes like, and we'll talk about this later, so much of your care for people ends up being figuring about, are you comfortable with these things? Because if you're not comfortable with that, with people saying, I'm turning away, you can't be helpful to them because you're going to immediately start trying to go in and push them into. Well, you should be. You should be happy with God. He loves you. He's a nice guy. Don't you know that? Well, they're they're not ready to hear that. And so, doing that kind of reflection, I think to 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 your question though, how deep can people go? Well, they'll go as deep as they need to. But again. We, as far as we're able to, we want to do it gently, and this is a, a key component, gently dosing ourselves in the pain. You can't do a weekend retreat and just submerge yourself for two days and then go through it all. Because that's right. I mean, an, an element of, of uh, our shock and this kind of thing is it protects us. The girl with the anxiety, her body was protecting her from experiencing something that would completely overwhelm her. And so... We're also then not helpful if we force people to go too far too fast. That's, again, pushing them into situations they're not ready for. Yeah. Now, it, well, well, people will go as deep as they need to often in, in their mourning and in their grief, which is a good thing. There does seem to be a real danger in the, they can get stuck in there quite easily. And, and as a pastor, you don't want to push them or pull them through this. You want to help. But... What is, what is your role in being able to help them through going into these deep and dark places without having them get trapped mm -hmm. in their grief in a, in a negative way? Are, are you thinking of a particular circumstance with that? I, I think it's, it's common, you know, those often, you know, the old widow or mm -hmm. something in the congregation who her husband died 50 years ago or something, mm -hmm. or, or something, and, and her life is just death. Yeah. All the time, death all the time, to the point where it's like mm -hmm. something needs to change. You're very unhealthy, yeah. but you don't, you can't just push somebody through that mm -hmm. either. You want to help, yes. But how do you do that in a in a good way? Yeah. So, a, a helpful way of thinking about it is is being a facilitator, facilitate mm -hmm. just to make easier. You're going to make easier the chance for her to encounter the full range of losses she's experienced. What Sometimes, and, and I don't want to put this on you always, there's this, this in our culture, the fear that if people go too much, they, they, they just end up there, or they won't get out quickly enough. Yeah, right. the, um, 
thing that we're doing, again, going back to bereavement, grief, and mourning, mourning gives us room to give expression to that, is, is recognizing that what will help the old widow is being able to encounter that. Now, you need to start doing a little bit of history on that mm -hmm. to prepare your mind. Okay, so husband died X number of years ago. She's experienced all these other losses. You know, what, what we start adding it up. So death of her husband, what kind of role did he play? What sort of husband was he? Um, what did it mean when he died? What sort of uh, other things did she lose with us? Who are the other people who have died? What about the health changes and all this kind of stuff? And, and kind of a simple rule of thumb is that the more complicated and the more loss factors, the longer it's going to take. And so, and then we're also building into that cultural context. So if she's somebody who's grown up thinking that tears are a sign of weakness and you need to be strong and carry on, it's going to take her that much longer to get there. And our role, if you want to take that on, is to facilitate or make easier room for her to encounter that. And because again, it's as they get to encounter that, that then they, that the burden starts to become lighter because they're not carrying it on their own. And so even uh, the most recent group that we had, you know, we were talking about sense of purpose or meaning. <clears throat> and one woman, her, her daughter died of a meth overdose and uh, uh, daughter was like 20, something like that. But so this is, she was about a year, and she was about 14 months after the loss. And she's just like, I just have no purpose, no, no, no meaning in, in living. And, and even as we talked about it, she's like, but you know, even in saying that, I feel better. Because, because then she's getting to like, she's not carrying that on her own. Um, and so, you know, even it, it, as you pick up, you see the, see the signals, the indicators, the cues. Oh, this person, this person doesn't have a joy of life. How can I facilitate that. Sometimes those cases might be, right. it's not possible. Right. There's too much. Or it's not possible in our life, to, or hers, whatever's left of it. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, and that, but we can try. What have we got to lose? Yeah. And so, you know, but it, it, it does serve as a warning when whatever factors, whether it's a loss, an overload of losses, whether it's the context of not being able to share, family history, all that, when we carry those, you just become the living dead. Yeah. Nothing, nothing is good. Right. Nothing's worth being a part of. And, and so <coughs> some of those types of situations can be hard to help, yeah. which is sort of a place of being proactive and saying, how can I, how can I, how can we as a congregation, how can we as a church make easier, create space for people who give expression to that stuff, right. surround them with love rather than isolating them in and we'll, 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 again, we'll talk about some of the complicating factors as we carry on. It's stuff that it just complicates and makes it go slower. It doesn't make the person a problem or disordered or stuff like that. Okay, anything else? Any other? Well, we'll um, we're going to do some, let me, just, let me just double check so that I and pace myself appropriately. All right, here's what we're going to do. We'll do the, uh, yes, okay. So we've got kind of two sections coming up. First, kind of looking at shapers of the grief. What, what actually, you know, people will say every person grieves differently, but what they're trying to say is each person's grief is unique. And so we'll look at the things that shape that, and then we'll kind of look at, you know, what are the experiences or the feelings of loss. So we'll do that, and uh, we'll try to breeze through that, and maybe not, we can, if you want more depth on that, you can, we can give you some resources to find it. But uh, we'll, we'll touch on that, and then um, go, from, go from there, and then pause for a break. All right, shapes your grief, your relationship with the person you died, or the person who died, or whatever you lost. If that person was a soulmate, it's going to be a lot harder lost than if it was a marriage relationship where you kind of didn't like each other, but you were only staying together for the kids. Um, significant, just like we also said, people who have died around the world already today uh, mm -hmm. that we don't know, there's no relationship there, it doesn't connect us. Again, our grief is anchored in love, 
you know, what kind of relationship was it? Was there depth of love? Was there a mixture? You know, all this kind of thing. Uh, your, the circumstances of death. Was it expected or unexpected? Was it sudden, prolonged, was it out of order or untimely? That is, was it a child dying before a parent? Um, this kind of thing. Uh, a sudden death creates the problem that we come to grief not ready to mourn. So just last Friday in our community, there was a, a I want to say boy, but he was a young man, he was like 19, I think, died in a car crash. And uh, close uh, members of our congregation, close friends of his family and knew him and they have a son like close to the same age and all this kind of thing. The family is just, their lives have been rocked because they've come to grief but they weren't ready to, they weren't ready to plan his funeral. That was not what they had planned for the weekend. They were going for a hockey tournament, not funeral planning. And you know you can contrast that with the perhaps a, if some of you might have experienced as a grandparent who's moved to hospice or palliative care, you know, less than six months to live. Okay, we know we, we've got to get our final visits in. Um, there's going to be a funeral. You know, oh, I've got to travel. Well, I'll do it now, and then I'll know that I'll have to come back again later for the funeral. There's a will that's, oh, we made sure that we got that in place. Uh, somebody will have to take care of the house, and we'll do da 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 da. All, all those kinds of things. You're prepared to give expression to grief. You know that there will be these mourning rites, funerals, family will come together, etc., etc. Um, which doesn't mean that it's easier, but it's just not a, as much of a shock to your system. And so thinking about that, and, and then there are specific circumstances that relate to disease or different types of death that can be, uh, just like there are other types of losses. A sudden unexpected job loss is different than a planned retirement. There's still going to be elements of grief, but the, the, the circumstance will reshape that a little bit. Ritual or funeral experience that really connects again to this point. Are you allowed to authentically mourn? One of our congregation members, her dad died, I think it was two years ago now. Sadly, her mom said to her, going into the funeral, just make sure you don't cry. So she, right away, is not given the room to authentically express her grief. Bottle it up. Just don't show any tears. Um, does, do you, does your experience end up trying to have a party instead of acknowledging the death? Are we celebrating a life? I, whenever people try to do that, I've never seen them celebrating. I always talk, introduce them funerals, we're here to mourn and give expression to our grief and this kind of stuff. We yeah, I remember even one, it was a son or grandson, I think a grandson. Well, we want to celebrate her and stuff, but the guy was wrecked. And, you know, I never saw him celebrate for a moment in that funeral. <laughs> yeah, you celebrate things you're happy about. You celebrate a birthday. Why? Because you're happy the person lived another year and you haven't died yet. You celebrate, <laughs> you celebrate a wedding. You celebrate that a couple's coming together. You celebrate good things. You celebrate that the semester's done, this kind of thing, uh, or that reading week is coming. You don't celebrate because somebody died, unless they're a terrible <coughs> person, and then you might celebrate. But usually you wouldn't go to that kind of ceremony. But what does that create? It creates a dissonance between what you need to do is give expression to a loss and the sadness and all the things that touched on it, but you're told to be happy. Can there be happiness? Yes. Can you have laughter? Yes. Can you tell a joke? Yes. But is the overall tone of the ceremony one of happiness? In that kind of, we're happy she's dead? Or he's dead? Probably not. Though it might be, depending on what she was like sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when grandma's a real, oh, we're recording it. When grandma's, <laughs> <laughs> caught myself. When, when you have a grandmother who is maybe a little heavy-handed in certain things, you, know, you just remind baptismal promises, not so much that. Uh, shape, uh, shapers of your grief. Uh, the people in your life. Are the people in your life ones you can talk to or not? Who can you talk to? Do you have people like that? We've got a family member who recognizes that amongst some of her women friends, you have to be careful what you say because they might just try to use it as gossip to everybody else. 
So those are not people you can authentically express your struggles with. Do you have people like that in your life? Sometimes what I've seen is that the, what makes the death of a spouse so hard is that was the only person that, a person that the, the individual had to talk to about those things. And so if you've got one person and you've got the mentality you have to be strong for the kids, then suddenly you have nobody to talk to. Or you've moved. People in our grief groups lots of times come, I've moved here recently, or I didn't have anybody else to talk to about this, but suddenly they find a new kind of family. I want to go faster. Your personality, again, related to, do you have the natural disposition where you're allowed to experience emotion? Or are you all up in your head and no heart? In which case, again, it'll be hard for you to encounter that kind of stuff and will slow down your capacity to give expression to that. And so you want to be tuned into that for yourselves and for those that you serve. Uh, the person who died, what role did they play? Was it your joker? The person who gave you a smile each day? Your rock, who was just, you know, you were super flustered, he or she was just always there. What, what role did that person play? Your gender, this is less about you and more about societal projections on you. So again, it goes back to that point, are men allowed to cry? Or are women allowed to be angry? Lots of times I'll see women who bring it up at first, no, no, I'm not angry. But then we start facilitating the discussion in a backdoor kind of way, yeah, yeah I'm really angry. <laughs> because they've picked up that cue, I'm not, I'm not allowed to be angry. Um, and so any, if it, it, there's, always, there's always good cues on whether you're reading a good resource on pretty much anything related to people. If they start making gender differentials, usually it's not a good resource. If they start saying <laughs> grief is universal, not a good resource. Grief is dependent on your ability to attach and make connections. Not everybody's able to do that, so it's not, not universal. Cultural background, again, related to that place of, do you come from a background where you're able to give expression? You know, German sort of, you know, in control, uptight, and straightforward, and we're not going to let things overwhelm us in an emotional kind of way. Well, that's going to create a problem when you need to give expression to, to your loss. And so, again, for you, you can do your personal reflection on where you have been brought up in. And then for those who serve, what kind of congregation am I in? What sort of, what's the culture of it? Sometimes some of our, our urban congregations, there isn't a uniformity there, but um, you can do it on an individual level. But then in other places, there, there is a strong uh, sense of origin. And then what does that teach people about how they're supposed to behave in the face of uh, loss and stuff like that? Uh, religious spiritual background. So again, what have you been taught? What have you absorbed? God wouldn't give you more than you can handle. Well, while I disagree with that, the, everything about that in so many levels uh, <laughs> is just sort of a misappropriation of some stuff. Uh, if, has that been what you're taught? God will always help you, or God will make sure it doesn't happen, or God will get you out of this, or whatever. You know, what's, what's that been? And then, again, even within our congregations, what is the culture around this kind of stuff? Because we might have, and we do, lots of official statements about what we believe in and how we are, but then there's always a culture about what, how it really is. And so, kind of like, we're all about grace, but we got a lot of rules on how you got to behave if you want that grace, or if you want to stay in that grace. Um, and so, is it a culture where you're allowed to, or encouraged to, enter into your, to your group? If you've got a whole bunch of other stuff going on, it sure makes it hard. If your health is failing, or you're in a car crash, somebody died, and you're in intensive care, you, you don't have the capacity to enter into your grief right now. You just need to stay alive. Or uh, Kai had mentioned that example. When you've got a whole bunch of other losses that have piled up, plus your health and everything else, it can be really hard to enter into that. And sometimes those take priority over uh, your own grief. Or, as lots of times happens, Somebody dies, you've got so much funeral planning, so much management of the estate, all the kind of stuff that goes on after that. You barely have a moment to breathe before you can, again, uh, get in touch with, with your grief. Oops. Uh, what have you learned in the past from your losses? I remember, so a, a, a woman in our congregation, 
she, she learned when her dog that she loved died when she was a kid, and she was not given the freedom <coughs> to mourn it authentically, not to get another pet. Best way around that, don't get another one. Because it hurt too much, and she wasn't given any room to, to give honest expression to it. And so she, part of her, and this is a complicated history in her family of origin, but you know, she learned all the rules about what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do, and so it was just better not to get another pet. Uh, your health, again, as it relates to everything else that's going on, there's a lot of work with grief, and so it takes a lot of energy out of us and can really drain us, and if there are too many other complicating issues, it can be too hard. Uh, I'm going to go through, I'm going to skip this question reflection portion and then go to the next part. Going kind of, those were the things that shaped our particular grief, and then what's our experience of it. So the, the family that had their son die on Friday, there will naturally be a lot of shock. Your, it's, a, it's a beautiful and wonderful way that your body protects you. The woman that I mentioned with the um, uh, anxiety and you know the seizure stuff, her body's protecting her from being overwhelmed and just essentially dying. And so that's a little bit to Andrew's point of bringing up that concern about going too deep. If it's too deep, too fast, it's too much. And so quite naturally our bodies protect us. Um, and it's really, again, it's not because we can't comprehend what death is. We know that death happens. We know it happens to everybody. We know that when you're dead, you stay dead. Except for, again, that Jewish guy who ruined the stats. Um, <laughs> but you, your head knows that. And it's not a problem with your cognitive capacity, especially as adults. Kids, it's a different story. Uh, it's your heart coming to terms with what's gone on. The person that you love is not here anymore. And it takes a while for that reality to sink in. And so, again, we can, I didn't, I know it's a seminary, but I didn't want to presume on your particular faith commitment. So okay, you can thank God or Allah or Buddha or whoever you like uh, that there is such a thing as shock. Because what do your shocks do on your car or your bike? They protect you from feeling the full effects of the road you're going over. And life is sure a lot better for them. Quite naturally for us as people, our life is better for having shock and numbness and not feeling everything all at once. Again, this is, you know, we want to time and pace it. This could go up to a few months following a loss. And in fact, lots of times what I see is the hardest thing for people is usually between a year and, and, and 18 months because they've fought to get through that first year, and then they relax a bit. Okay, I'll be okay. And suddenly they feel like it almost feels worse because they've started opening up to feeling rather than just kind of hunkering down and getting through. Um, and so we, we can value this. It's a natural way to protect us. And then slowly and gently enter into it rather than trying to experience it all at once. You might have disorganization, confusion, searching, yearning. And these are kinds of, the, again, recognizing that it's not just an emotional experience. It affects your cognitive abilities, your physical sense of self, that you're all over the place. You can't concentrate. You don't know what's going on. Sometimes people, they won't even remember the funeral that happened, which is a good reminder. Don't just like preach a sermon, but give them a copy, maybe a little bit later or something like that. They can't remember what you said. Might have been gold. Might not have been gold, so they don't give it to them. But if it was gold, then give it to them later. Print it out, give it to them later. Um, and so we've got issues of like, you know, they've got well, the fancy word is a polyphasic behavior. You got doing 25 things at once and can't get any of them actually accomplished. Some of you might experience that quite naturally, um, uh, which is a separate issue. Uh, but you have sort of a lethargy of grief. You don't have energy for getting out and doing things. Um, very common, very early on. That anxiety and fear and panic, your sense of security or safety has been threatened. Again, if it happened once, it can happen more another time. Uh, and anxiety and depression tend to go, they're like, almost like symptoms of the same kind of thing. What's the anxiety about? A globalized sense of insecurity. What, what stops me from getting hurt? How can I protect myself? You can't. 
there is no way to actually protect yourself. And what happens in the face of a loss or something significant is you're confronted face on with that reality. Because it's fine for you to cognitively recognize that, but then you experientially feel it. There is no way to protect myself in this world or in this life. Almost anything could happen at any particular time and there's nothing I can do about it. For you, for your kids, for your family members, for a wife, for parents, and whoever else, nothing. And so, you know, that sense of coming to terms with that and, 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 and you know, just that threat to our, our sense of safety. So explosive emotions, anger, hate, resentment, blame, terror, rage, jealousy, a nice way to think about them is protest emotions. Something has happened that isn't right, and I'm unhappy with it. And what are those about? Deep down, what I'm actually feeling is a complete sense of helplessness, powerlessness, hurt, and pain. And sometimes our anger is a way of trying to get it back. You might have known angry people in your life. What are angry people trying to do? Get some control back when they're feeling powerless and you know they're almost they're, they're correlated you know the greater the sense of helplessness the greater the anger and you can even explore on your own when are the times you're feeling most angry and what's that connected to you know getting to to see what's underlying it and so we don't you know we want to think about are we comfortable can we be around angry people can you be around people who are experiencing that kind of explosiveness um, guilt and, and regret, sort of stuff that comes up with an if only. Um, and there's some different types of guilt, and I want to be careful to, to acknowledge, especially in a church setting, we can typically connect guilt to a moral wrong. Very rarely have I heard of a case of any actual moral wrong when there's guilt expressed. What's the guilt? If I had just been with him all the way down to the surgery, maybe he wouldn't have died. Because I, I calmed him down, and I held his hand, but I had to go, and blah, blah, blah. He died on the way. That's not a moral wrong or failing. Uh, if I had just been there, if I hadn't gone home that night, or, or whatever else. Well, that's not a, a wrong, but you feel guilt connected to if I hadn't done that. Or I just went home for a shower. Well. Because what, what is the person communicating? Well, I would give up every single shower if I could be there to make it, make this person still live. That, it was a no-brainer. I would have done whatever. That would, and so it makes it seem silly or ridiculous that because I decided to go home and have a shower and, and get a good sleep, he or she died. Um, some of the other types of guilt we want to think about is survivor guilt. I survived and not these other people. You see that motor vehicle accidents, especially if it's the driver who survives and the passengers who don't. This doesn't make sense. Uh, relief guilt. I feel relieved that the person has died, but then because of our relief, we feel guilty about it. So this is, again, a projection onto people. But, you know, I, I can think of a, a situation where, um, or where it will come up. You've got a depressed teenager who eventually dies by suicide. Those parents may feel a sense of relief because what they've lived with for the last year, three years, five years, is getting up two to three times a night just to check if that child's still alive. And they are torn apart by it, and it's been an oppressive burden to them. And so as much as they're saddened by the death, there's a sense of relief because they can actually sleep through the night. And it's not because they didn't love. Relief is experienced in people who are uh, cared for the dying. And there's lots of research that as soon as that dying process is over a year, then it starts really hurting the caregiver uh, in, in significant ways and making it difficult. There can be relief. And so uh, people can feel guilty about feeling relieved. Or they can experience joy guilt, which is kind of connected, where they have a moment of joy following the person's death and then feel guilty that they're happy. And what, what's that about? Well, because they're wrestling with thinking that joy means I didn't love. But helping them see that having a moment of joy doesn't mean you stop loving the, the person or are unfaithful. There can be magical thinking in guilt. You know what, two days ago I wished that person was dead and now he died. 
sort of thinking that, you know, we can't help that, but think that maybe I shouldn't have, and now he's dead, or she. And so needing to work through that. Again, that's not a moral failing. Um, other personality factors leading, you know, things related to childhood stuff that maybe you've learned that when bad things happen, it's your fault, and so you feel guilty that something has happened. All right. Sadness and depression. Let's see, I've got... Yeah, we'll just do one more and then we'll pause. Can you guys handle that? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Um, so sort of what we think is uh, hallmark emotions of, of grief. Related to sort of a lack of joy, anhedonia, uh, uh, an incapacity to experience joy, a lethargy, just no energy for it. Um, potentially most painful, but we want to encourage them. A little depression is very good. The depression of grief is highly recommended. Because what does it do? It's our body in this beautiful way slowing us down. Not getting straight back to work two days later, but slowing you down so you can give attention to what you need to give attention to. Because our brains will just keep trying to function. Or our culture will encourage us to keep going on, but our bodies are smarter than our brains, and so they'll slow us down and encourage us to give attention to those things that need giving attention to. Um, within this, you know, we want to, um, well, I, I guess a couple other things. Um, it can take weeks or months till you feel the full effects of all that. Um, and to recognize that, again, in our culture, there's sort of this unwritten rule that, while well, physical illness is something that it's okay to take a rest for, uh, and usually is beyond your control, emotional distress is like your own fault, and you just need to get over it. And so if you're too sad too long, we're gonna shame you for it. You should be over it by now, it's been six months, it's been 12 months, it's been 18 months. Excuse me, too long. Uh, but the only way of lessening the intensity is moving towards it, not away from it. Uh, within this, we want to uh, uh, recognize that an element of, of suicidal wishes are also very frequent and common. But being attentive to passive suicidal wishes and active ones, and what's the difference? I would be okay if I didn't wake up tomorrow morning. That's a passive suicidal wish. What's that about? It's been too much. This is more than I can handle, and I would be okay if I didn't have to experience it anymore. Now, we can jump in if we're clinically minded or uncomfortable with strong emotions and say, well, do you have a means and a, and a plan? And then we're gonna use suicide intervention kind of resources, call 911 and get that person carted off. Or you can lift that person up. you would be okay if you didn't wake up in the morning, huh? Yeah, it's just, it's been too much, and I can't handle this. I don't want to handle it anymore. We're honoring that rather than telling them to get over it or move past that kind of thing. And so we can uh, acknowledge that those kinds of things will happen, but we want to be as sensitive to the difference when it's getting to be active. Just like when it comes to depression, being sensitive to a clinical depression versus depression of grief, and there's some tools for differentiating that, but also recognizing um, uh, that depression on its own doesn't mean bad or you need pills. Though probably what you'll see a lot is that people will go to meds. It's too much, I don't want to experience this, go to the doctor and they'll give you the pills. All right, one last one and then we'll stop. So relief and release. So sometimes again, it's, it's that, uh, uh, that was that relief guilt. Um, so relief and release, sometimes it's a matter of giving yourself the permission to experience those feelings of, of release. Um, and so you can you get this kind of thing when people say it's finally over. It's been a long go and we're okay being done with it. Um, and this can happen even when certain traumatic events can be anticipated. You know, you're thinking about suicide or domestic abuse or cancer deaths. Um, these kinds of things. You can anticipate the event, and so when it happens, at least it's, it's over now. So I don't have to live. The fear of it happening can sometimes be worse than the experience of the event or what's happened afterwards. Or it becomes an element of a very burdensome because it's always there. Uh, so, 
Uh, we're going to touch on this next bit afterwards. We'll pause for a little. Um, any questions or reflections, or should we just, you know what, never mind. I'm not even going to listen. We'll <laughs> pause. Let's just stop for 10 minutes, and then you can reflect on that. And if you want to bring stuff up, bring it up when we come back. So we're 2.30. Does that work OK? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. For instance, there are a bunch of wildflower yeah. bands and sort of yeah. solo, for which it does to be given to every public service. There are more about the sign. Mm -hmm. Well, I know, but that's the thing. That's the thing, right? The donut, right? Donut, they, those signs donut. are allowed yeah. there. You know, the donut you can donut ask donut. for uh, yeah, a sure. black ribbon to put on your oh, picture of it. all after your spouse dies. That's weird. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's a weird kind of like this is the one place where. And you know, like you're, you're supposed to be a statutory holiday when she dies. Yeah. Right? On, on the day of her funeral, so that people can watch it. But don't take too much time off when your spouse dies. Yeah. Right? It's kind of, it's really. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad that it's a mark, so I would take the time to. I'd shed it here, right? I'd shed it here. You know, for my spouse, it would be. There's something I would like a little bit more fun.
direction left. Yeah. 
to have a donut. The teacher found a spitball in a glass of water. <laughs> and she just lost it on these kids and got caught for it. And they had to just spend all you need for spring and gum off the donut. bottom of old desk. Go ahead. Everyone has a donut. I can do that. Yeah, yeah, so, so when you're seeing the cross from the mother who has lost two children, cut grass. there was like so a week that it rained. Oh, so this is like, like crying all the rest of God allow this to happen. To school already. So to there's like, in the school, there's those guys that don't speak much English. You can't talk, they're just like, it's great. I don't have to get some gum on the bottom of the will either... You so lost in her grief that she my, my favorite was always when like, you actually slash it. You're like, <laughs> you, oh, your, your hand is like, oh no. Oh, yeah, yeah, she she like, oh. The one time I got. I wonder if but then that's also like, school. One of the In elementary school? What the heck? And then I so many of that. I mean, that. Bethany Lutheran Church. Oh, I know. Non stop. Yeah. But well, I, the MPC lets you get past it. Yeah, the MPC were like, Josh, you are amazing. Yeah. 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 This is yeah. the MPC yeah. 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 like, choosing. You guys would be probably so much Yeah, you walk together and send there like, we think you should clean your sky for another announcement. The question I'm wondering, who's building it? She couldn't have a party or a day, right? Yeah. 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 I observed because they're top to bottom. Like, yeah, the brand that she had at lunch looked like they're, they're not expensive. Like, 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 so like, 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 Resume. And are, are, did you have any questions or reflections or comments on that last section? We did kind of the tables of grief, the experience of grief. Uh, how do the two different settings um, kind of compare? Like when you are grieving, or wh when you're facilitating a group of people who are all grieving, versus when one person is grieving amidst like a group of friends who are not grieving uh, in the same way. Like how? How would you, no, the, the thought is not complete in my head. Um, how, how do you help a person to move through those two different areas of life, mm -hmm. where it's welcomed and where it's maybe less yeah. welcomed? One of the, the really neat things about a, a support group, um, and you can even just reframe that as a small group or mm -hmm. you know commonalities and stuff, um, but in a grief support group, the real power is in people getting to like connect with others who know what they're experiencing and can relate to. A huge, a huge thing that people experience that drives them to support groups is that they've been, they've picked up the cues and essentially they've not been allowed to grieve. You know, people have shut them down and said nasty things, not meaning to be nasty, but things that have not helped them. Um, and so. The power of the group is being able to connect to people, and you know, I, I, I'll put it this way: the when we, you know, even our last group, the thing that people love is they can come there and say anything. They will not get shamed for it, or judged, or punished, or whatever. So they knew that they could freely say, "With me there," and I didn't hide that. I don't hide that I'm a pastor. That they don't believe in God anymore, or they're not really interested in that, because there was enough safety there established, and this becomes really powerful. People who are um, in the context, and that goes back again to the people in your life. So if you've got people in your life who will not give you permission, for us as pastors, we can begin to be people who create that. And then we think about how can we facilitate that in the congregation, Ben's idea of how do we, how do we give acknowledgement to the people who are hurting so we can attend to them. And so, yeah, it's, it's helping people, sometimes it's helping people recognize that. And, treating with compassion the people in their lives. They're not trying to be, they're not malicious. They're not trying to harm you, but, and they're trying to help. They just don't know that what they're doing is not helpful. Um, and so being a, attuned to that, uh, sometimes we can help with that, sometimes we can't. But you know, wherever people go, they'll experience that, and so then, you know, teaching them to have compassion. You know, the person's not trying to harm you, 
but that's just somebody you probably don't want to spend too much time with right now when you have some special needs that that require help and so you know that's where we can encourage you know disconnection and then say who are the people you can talk to spend more time with them right now because the other people are not helpful sometimes that's the church don't spend time there get away from it for a while if you're in a congregation that's going to harm people they shouldn't be there you're just causing them a, a, another hurt and creating more pain if you're forcing them to be there or around around people who are unhelpful um you don't usually hear people say don't don't come to church yes <laughs> um have you ever run into cases where maybe a family or a group has mourned or grieved somebody even before they were like actually gone like mm -hmm. somebody who had like long-term yeah. illness or yeah. Yeah, the, the fancy language is anticipatory grief. You're already you're already feeling the grief of the loss be, that you know is coming, but hasn't just quite happened yet. And so, um, relatively common, and uh, because people know it's happen, what's going to happen, and they're already thinking about the consequences of that. What's it going to mean? Oh, grandpa's dying. He's not going to be around when my kids graduate from high school or get married. Oh. Yeah. And then you start encountering that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Or thinking about what are the consequences of this, or this surgery or this kind of thing will create this sort of situation. Have you seen a lot of relief guilt in those situations? Does that tend to be where it comes up more in your experience or is it more just kind of random? Uh, it can be. It, usually it's, it's, it's usually after is where you experience that kind of mm -hmm. relief guilt. Because then it's, it's a relief that now that you know the person has died and because what's happened uh you know over the course of the past six months or year mm -hmm. somebody's been called into service lots of times a family member to a type of service they're not comfortable with or to a level of attention that they haven't been used to so if you're over at dad or mom's house every single day to help out when before you hadn't been that's where you there's a sense of relief when it's done mm -hmm. You can kind of have your life back again. Other questions or reflections? With the support group that you've been involved with or others you may know about, do you find that there are a fair number of people who come with those losses that are not as socially recognized as losses or that a lot of them are the typical ones? I mean, deaths of family members, friends. Usually the groups that we've run are for death losses, but then it within the group they're invited to recognize other types. If you don't have, you know, ideally, and if you have a big enough program, what, what the research shows is the, the more closely you can connect types of loss together, the more cohesion and support. So there's a big grief support, AHS grief support program in Calgary. They can, because it's big enough, they can separate, so you'll have like spouse loss, but you can have young spouse loss or older spouse loss. And so then you're creating lots of lots of safety and commonality. Um, but yeah, if you if you introduce like my house burned down with the person whose spouse has died, long term spouse, you're, then you're creating dissonance. It's a good place to like you still want to care for them, but you're doing something separate for that. So. How important do you find pre-existing relationships, like building a relationship with the people, and then when something like this happens, how important is that to have that in place to be able to reach out to them? Um, so people who come to our grief groups, I've had no contact with. But you can establish it. If you're thinking about congregationally, um, you know, whatever. I mean. Always, more connection and safety is going to help. It's not going to hinder, but it never means that you can't establish it. Unless, unless what you're, unless what you're doing is changing your way of operating to a new way that you hadn't been. So if you're a bit of a jerk, and then you decide now that somebody's died will be nice to you, that's going to create dissonance. But if you know you haven't had a chance to get to know the person, whatever, you could still come in there because. <coughs> What people can very quickly pick up, and you guys have done this, you do it intuitively. You know the people you can get along with, and who you can talk to, and that kind of thing. And you'll know the people you can't. They, everything they communicate 
communicates one thing or another. So people who are unsafe communicate that in more than their words. People who are safe communicate that in more than their words. And so you'll know. And so you can, I mean, I do vacancy stuff, and it, I don't need to know them too well to be able to do that. And so, but you're needing to then, maybe to that point, you need to do the work to establish the trust and the safety initially. If you've already got that established, then the person knows that they can get into that. So yeah, there isn't the pressure to make sure everybody, everything is, you know everybody to a super great depth in, in order for that to happen. Okay. We're going to do this quickly and then we'll get into uh, um, our stuff on some trauma and, and these kinds of things. Now, I th and, and just, just to confirm, did we say 4, 4.30? Where are you guys at? 4? I think 4 is what was announced. But no. Okay. And where are you guys at for time? We did 4.30. Is that going to create distress, dilemmas, new grief? Possibly for my wife, who is working right now. That will create grief for her. <laughs> <laughs> no, normally, the building officially yeah. closes at 4. I mean, okay. sometimes people will stay a bit longer, but that's okay. Okay, all right, well, we'll, 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 we'll work around that. Um, rather than stages of grief, we can think about reconciliation. It's reconciliation to be friend or become friendly with again. Some other people will talk about uh, grief tasks or this kind of thing. But I find these to be best encompassing and, and uh, um, all encompassing and, and helpful in this way. So what, what, they're not in an order you proceed through, but one thing about the very first one is that it really kind of facilitates the rest. So acknowledging the reality of the loss, which is again, a task that is greater than your head comprehension. It's not fundamentally cognitive. Grief is anchored in love. What needs to comprehend that? The heart. This is where we can really help people get off to a good start by having a great funeral. So you want to do lots of work on figuring out what is it that makes a great funeral and what we're doing here. A visitation is fantastic. Touching a cold, dead body, do it as often as you can. I actually, what I what I try to do anytime there's a funeral, I I, I make sure I touch that body. I need to feel that it's cold and this person's dead. It that's about heart thing. That's not about head. My head comprehends what death is. It's about anchoring in your heart for people. To then see a coffin and a person in it, not moving. Important work for acknowledging in our heart. Symbolic actions, wheeling the coffin in, lowering it into a hearse, lowering it into the ground. Whatever you can get them to throw on top of that coffin, get them to do that. The, it anchors, if they'll do dirt, get them to do the dirt. Pick it up and throw that first bit of dirt on. What does that mean? Whoa. It means too much to explain in words. And it's so profound and so powerful, but it helps them anchor that and acknowledge the reality. This is, this is my person I love. That their body's in there, and now I'm throwing dirt on because they're going in the ground, and they're not going to come out again. But the, you could say words like that, but the action is more powerful. It's a symbolic action uh, that, that means something. and so. You know, making sure that you can do that helps them get off to a good start. Funerals are a, a rite of initiation that gets them off to a good start. They, they move them into the next phase of life. And we've lost a lot of our, our uh, rites of initiation. And so um, marriage is a rite of initiation. It helps people acknowledge the, the end of a past and the, a new beginning, which is why when people have been living together for a long time and are not married, it confuses us. What should we call them? Is that a boyfriend? Yeah, but they've been together for like 25 years and they own a house, they got kids and a dog and everything. Okay. Boyfriend sounds too simple, but are they, well, partner, we'll just do partner because we, whatever. But the, you, you didn't have the right of initiation to publicly acknowledge the end of a previous and the beginning of a new. Uh, weddings are a right of initiation, funerals are a right of initiation. You are now getting acknowledged as a widow or a bereaved child or a bereaved parent or whatever. That, that way of life is, is uh, or that experience of life is now completed and now you're beginning a new phase. It initiates you. It will help you then um, 
move into that next level if you're doing a good funeral, feeling the pain, encountering it. Again, you'll dose yourself gently in it, but really what you need to do is encounter the pain in order to find some healing from it. You want to remember the person who died. Again, funerals are powerful places for that. Tributes, photo tributes, remembrances, uh, table remembrance tables, and all kinds of things. As much of, uh, of that that you can get into the all of the, the afternoon or whenever it is, the better. Because we get to, uh, part of that process is moving from a relationship of presence to a relationship of memory. The relationship is not over, it's just gone from one where we can count on the person's presence with us to one where we anchor them in our hearts and minds. Again, we're not stopping loving, but we need to fill our hearts with as much memory as we can and go over things. That's why people tell stories at funerals, why you go back and you remember it. It, it. It's really powerful because you can, whether as a pastor, and I, I appreciate this lots of times, or, or as family members, you if the funeral's been done well, and I, by that I include the ceremony and the reception, that's a, they're both essential components, you can walk away knowing the person better than when they lived. You'll learn more, and you can tell the stories, and, and this kind of thing, because everybody has a different angle on who the person was, and, and different experiences. And so you want to facilitate doing that. Developing a new self-identity. Who am I now? Am I still a husband if my wife has died? Am I still a brother or sister if I don't have a my brother or sister has died? What am I going to do? You know, especially when we think of certain types of losses where future hopes and dreams are tied to the individual, then oh, these are these are profound spiritual and and uh, kinds of questions that you don't just answer cognitively. Kind of like I mean, even thinking about teenage years, early twenties, when you're thinking about who am I, you didn't just like flip the switch and that was it. Oh, I just learned about it. I read it in a book. This is who I am. No, oh, it takes time. I think I want to be a pastor. Huh. All right. Well, you've been working on that. And hopefully some of your ideas about what being a pastor is are different than when you first thought about being a pastor. Or for the guys who've been on vicarage, hopefully your ideas about being a pastor are different than before you went on vicarage. Um, and some of those kinds of things. You enrich it, and you grow in it, and you change in that. And so it takes time. And then even as you begin serving in a congregation, things will change as you experience that. And so there's this deep sense of figuring out who we're going to be. Searching for meaning is, is this place of like, what is life? What's death? And yes, we can have some answers, Bible verses about that, but it's even a little bit bigger than that. What does it mean to enjoy our lives? To enjoy them in community, to love, to open our hearts to being hurt. Uh, what is the role of the church in that? How do we contemplate that from a uh, you know, pastoral angle, a Christian angle? Uh, what role does God have in that? Is God the one who protects us from death? Or evil things? not? Or do they happen when he steps away for a moment and goes to the bathroom or something? Uh, or has a nap? I don't know. He's getting old and gets tired. Uh, you know, like, because it, you, you're, you're invited into those things to contemplate a rich theology. And so like the people I mentioned in the support group would say, no, I'm, I'm ditching God because of this stuff. They're invited to enrich their theology to handle these kinds of things. And so for you too, think, can, your, can your theology handle that? Can your theology handle a seemingly good spouse that you counted on cheating, you, cheating on you, leaving, running away? Can your theology handle the death of your own child? Or disease? Or something very tragic? The abuse of your child? You know how, what the numbers are on you know, women and girls? Can your theology handle your own daughter getting abused? Uh, or your sister, or something like that? Or finding out that your mom actually already was? Don't ask her, because I might know the truth. Well, it's up to you. Um, 
But yeah, getting to say like, whoa, 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 what goes on in all of that? And so we get to give people a taste in a funeral, but they've got work of going through the rest of that. And then finally, receiving continued support. Um, mourning requires the support of others, and it doesn't end at the funeral. People might give a couple weeks after. What we have the privilege of doing is keeping people in mind for way longer than that. Six months, a year, two years. Sometimes people say that 18 to 36 months is the worst time because everybody's left. They've expected you to be over it by now. They've forgotten. Uh, it's a non-issue and so, yeah. Any uh, questions or reflections on this segment? So we'll touch a little bit on more traumatic stuff. Um, Andrew had mentioned that, and then we'll do that relatively briefly. We'll aim to do another break, and then kind of have 45 minutes uh, uh, in our last part where we talk about sort of pastoral care and work on that stuff. Um, I don't know if you, how many of these you've seen, the glass brick walls. You see a bit, but not totally. Um, and this is a way of kind of illustrating, we learn about how the world works through our experiences of it. Kind of like the kid I mentioned. He knew that if he drove with dad or mom, he got there. And while they maybe seen accidents, right? It wasn't like he was incapable of comprehending accidents happen. Never experienced one. Um, we will observe evil things or bad things happening, but if we don't experience them ourselves, we will kind of learn that it doesn't happen to us or it'll happen to other people and maybe have justifications for that kind of thing. Um, our experience may teach us that as long as you work hard or treat people nicely, you're gonna be okay. That's kind of the message of Proverbs. Traditional wisdom would say, you know, pay your taxes, work hard, you know, uh, go to church and things will be okay. And that works lots of times, but not always. Um, your experience may teach you, you, you uh, receive what you, you give, or you, you reap what you sow, you get what you deserve. You know, I'll have people even at the church say, thank God there's karma. <laughs> now, what they're, what they're just reflecting is that they've lost the vocabulary of, of biblical language. That essentially is what they're saying. You reap what you sow, you, you get what you deserve, um, this kind of thing. But you know what? That's not a cognitive exercise. They've never done research to say, do a controlled study to see if you actually reap what you sow. Uh, you know, and that's what like Psalms, uh, the Psalms kind of relate. Psalm 73, I see the wicked and they're fat and sleek and you know, things go well for them and this kind of thing because you don't always reap what you sow. That's the problem with that kind of wisdom. But they're not talking about a cognitive thing. They're talking about how they're related to the world. The issue happens, or the issue is that what happens when something happens? That shatters that. And that's kind of, we don't see the world clearly, because to a certain degree, the raw anxiety would paralyze us. If we fully recognize that there's nothing guaranteeing we'll get home tonight, or that our loved ones won't get hurt, or our family, or our kids, if we took that in deeply and realized that every moment is precarious, well, that'd be too hard to, that'd be too hard to engage with. And so we, we kind of have to back off that a little bit and say, well, probably it's pretty reliable on the home. Learn from experience these kinds of things. Probably the kids are going to be fine. We're probably going to wake up in the morning, this kind of thing. Now, we, we deceive ourselves and we say, that's no, never going to happen, but it's too hard if we are in the rawness of that. And that's kind of the challenge. And so what happens when something significant happens? That's just shattered. And so we'll look, touch on... Um, those sort of things, think of traumatic losses. And then using sort of these categories, anticipated, violent, unanticipated, not violent. So it can be anticipated, you're expecting it, and violent, we might say medicine. Some military or police actions can be anticipated, the prisoner of war can be anticipated, war is happening. Domestic abuse can be anticipated, especially as it carries on. Um, yeah. uh, cancer death, 
can be anticipated and painful as suicide. Completed or attempted can be anticipated, can be violent. Um, and so that, that has an element. Uh, anticipated and nonviolent. So divorce, empty nest, cancer death, job loss, suicide. Um, you know, they may be dreaded, but they're perhaps not violent, but maybe anticipated. Uh, they can be, and this is, this is the category that tends to fall most of ours, sudden and violent, especially so manslaughter, murder, natural disasters, military or police action, car crash, sexual assault, rape, suicide. Um, you know, suicide is in every category, right? It can be violent or nonviolent, it can be anticipated, not anticipated. Um, but these are, these are ones where we think of it. it's unexpected and violent. Others can be sudden, but nonviolent. Cardiac arrest, cancer, or it's unexpected death, job loss, suicide. But in general, we would say that those that are more violent tend to be more traumatic, um, and that's sort of, you know, it's not a, it's not a simple open and shut, um, but the more traumatically experiences, and they tend to threaten our basic needs. If you encountered in Psych 101, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, just physical, uh, physical needs, food, water, clothing you know, sense of safety, next. Those two basic needs get threatened because suddenly our world isn't safe and we don't know if we can get what we usually get. <coughs> now we might, and, and, and this is where when you think about it in terms of PTSD, so if you've encountered people who've been in the military, who work in the police forces, or who serve those who do, thinking instead of a disorder, it's just, it's a traumatic uh, way of encountering loss that's, that's still anchored in grief, but it's just got more uh, complicated things to it. So we can think of a trauma, one way of defining it, uh, something of such intensity or brutality or magnitude of horror that it would overwhelm any human being's capacity to cope. Um, and that's not saying something's wrong with the person, but we're then talking in terms of a, a normal response to an abnormal experience. You don't normally have to experience that kind of stuff, certainly in our society these days, um, and we're thankful we don't. So after a traumatic uh, event, then you're replaying it, and, and that's one of these unique features about traumatic grief. It ends up having kind of a twofold experience. One's related to the event itself, and one's related to the fallout grief. So what can we think of in particular? You're going to have people that have been sexually abused. You may be shocked to find how many actually are. And again, this is the number of you know, women especially, but men as well. And so you're having people who have you know, lived as a, out of that or out of the hurt of that. And maybe they've been given help to heal from that or maybe not. So whether, and I'm just going through the ones in my head that I know in our congregation, family member or, uh, or babysitter as a child, um, stepfather, uh, brother, uh, these kinds of things, you know, they've experienced that. And so how can we help them comprehend what it's like uh, or help them facilitate working through that? because they have spiritual effects. Very consistently, those who have had not just abuse, but lots of other things, uh, is it, or I'll do generalization here. People will understand God based on their experience as a child. If your dad's a, is this on? Is it on? Yes. All right. If your dad's a jerk, I just have to clean up the line. If your dad's a jerk, you're gonna experience God as a jerk. If you've known, your parents to play favorites and you weren't one of them, you'll know that God does the same. And so all that grace stuff your pastor talks about may be beautifully articulated, doesn't apply to you. If what you've known is that everything is conditional about your the love of your parents, there's a good chance, and they, again, I'm using examples of people that I, that I serve, if you've known that love is conditional based on you performing your deeds properly and that every kind of, you're living on the edge of having to kind of prove that you deserve it, 
Well, then you're going to think about God that way. He's just waiting to pull the trigger. He's looking to damn you, and he'll probably enjoy it a little bit, but you might get out on the loophole that Jesus died for you and, and that kind of thing. Um, or if the parent figures in your life have always dropped you. So one, one woman kind of came, she was like, she was unemployed and just gone through it. Uh, they got married, they didn't even last a number of months. He was abusive, all kinds of things. She was not working. I just want to find the will of God in this stuff. Find God's will for me, working. Well, what was that about? She was paralyzed by the fear that even God would drop her if she didn't find the right thing, the right job. Getting to work, you know, recognize that that was anchored in her experience of life. What was her experience? You get dropped if you're not satisfying those people who are, you're looking to care for you. And so, you know, working through that to say, oh, is there room to even make mistakes with God? Will he love you anyways? To maybe not find his will. Maybe he doesn't have a will and you can just choose. And getting to work through that. For her, it was, it was anchored in, in that experience. So, the traumatic events, again, uh, especially the more traumatic, they'll have an element or a component that's focused around the event and then an element that's the sort of the grief or the losses that fall out of that. And so being attuned to that, and what that often means is replaying something over and over again. So again, this is a place for your personal reflection. Can I listen to that? Or am I going to say, ah, oh, she keeps talking about this over and over and over again. Same thing. That's more about you than it is about her. So needing to do that kind of discernment and reflection. And then we'll kind of touch on being able to do that regularly. And so this is kind of one of the issues that we experience <coughs> in our world. Sort of, and, and these days, as things get medicalized, as mental health gets medicalized, as spirituality gets medicalized, <coughs> is this just something biochemical that's going on? Or is there something more to life than that? And I think certainly as... Uh, men preparing to be pastors and as Christians we can say no I, I think there's something more to life than just the bouncing around of the molecules in our in our bodies and the firing of the synapses and that kind of thing and so then what we're looking at is recognizing that love is something more than just an evolutionary impulse that there's a certain spiritual nature to life and to death and that loss creates grief. And so it moves us, if I can use this language, into a spiritual journey of heart and soul. We're not facilitating you know, five steps for getting over these things or managing your behaviors. What we're acknowledging is that there's a deep and profound struggle that's going on when people are confronted with all kinds of change. And some of it they're recognizing, some of it they're not. But they're also fitting within this cultural context and all these complicating factors that are creating all kinds of challenges for them. Um, some of these things that come out of the more traumatic stuff, and I think even again, if we want to just think about these as normal reactions to abnormal events, are creating fear and fight or flight. Well, when you're backed into a corner, when you're saved, your world has been rocked, it's kind of a natural thing. Withdrawal and, a, and avoidance. You want to think carefully about people's practices in general and even spiritual. Sometimes they need to go to sort of a personal exile. Maybe you experience that too. Sometimes they need to go away from people, from regular demands of life, so I can just kind of take a break. And so quite naturally, when people have experienced some very traumatic events, there's a place of withdrawing. I don't, I don't have the energy for that. I'm not there. I just need to be kind of cared for. I'm not in the space for going out and having fun like I used to. And that might take a lot longer than you expect. And thinking about it too, faith-wise, and it's going to be shaped significantly by people's experiences of the church. Is the church a place where you can be sad, torn apart, and broken? For most, it's not. And so they're not going to come if they feel like they can't put on their happy face. 
And I think it's very important to recognize our cultural context of sort of a mainline Protestant group. It's not been a place where pe nobody in their right mind says, oh, your life's a train wreck, go to the church. Everybody knows you're not safe there always. There are congregations and there are pastors you will be safe with, but that's not a cultural universal in North America. And so people, again, and that you might be the most loving pastor that the world has ever seen, but their baggage and experience of the church is that it's not a safe place for them. So they may withdraw five months, six months, a year, until they're ready to come back. That's not about you, that's about them, it's about all the people who have taught them beforehand. So there's a place of acknowledging that. And a place of acknowledging that, yeah, in some contexts they're not gonna be safe, they're not gonna be able to talk about that, and so that's fine. Can we walk alongside them without pressuring them to get back to church? Again, that's, that's about you and your capacity to work through that, to have that kind of patience, that kind of care. This, these kinds of things, um, we kind of touched on them. All those shapers of grief, they can all be potentially complicating. That is, they can all make it more difficult for people to get through. Circumstances can be traumatic and sudden and hard to work through. Uh, your personality and your capacity to access emotion may make it really hard for you to get through that. Your relationship may have been really messy. Um, your access to or use of support systems may be very limited and you may not be able to get the kind of support you need. That's going to make it harder. Your background again, if it's taught you that you're not allowed to show weakness and that you know, sadness or tears or weakness, it's going to make it harder for you. And again, it's not that there's something wrong with you, but that's what you've been taught. That's how you've been conditioned and that's going to complicate it. You're going to have to go a lot slower. So for the person who's intellectualizing all their grief and starts, you know, whenever you talk about it, they say, well, I, you know, grief happens to everybody. And, well, this is, this is how grief things go, blah, blah, blah. They're just n making a nice intellectual defense without having to get there. They'll read lots of things and all this kind of stuff, but they'll never access their heart. Again, all of these things, and we kind of touched on it, can complicate it. Family systems influences what's going on in your immediate family. Are you allowed to give expression to these kinds of things? What have you been taught about that? Um, you know, was there a ceremony? More, more and more often, there isn't. Or, at a recent family one, guest of honor isn't even invited to attend. You know, that, that which is to say, we'll do a celebration of life, no remains present. Who's this for anyways? <laughs> you know, if, if, if you have, a, and that's where again, dis, try to steer people towards a traditional funeral rather than the memorial as so far as you can have it. You can create that. Um, if a loss is stigmatized, people are disenfranchised. <coughs> so if it's your mistress who dies, you're not gonna be encouraged to mourn that authentically. I would encourage you to not have a mistress, but if she does die, you're not gonna be encouraged to mourn that authentically. Same sex losses not going to be encouraged to mourn that. Uh, suicides, things that are taboo, people will not be allowed to talk about that. Um, you know, we're, we're thinking about those kinds of situations that, uh, you know, and the, and the variety of them where you won't be welcome to talk about them. We talk about as disenfranchised grief, uh, where, you're, where you're not allowed to give expression to it. All right. Any uh, questions on that kind of stuff? So far, reflections. Maybe you're just hoping to avoid it. <laughs> I guess, um, as pastors, how do we deal with people who are maybe going through some of those taboo losses? Um, like, especially in our church, I can think of a handful of examples that could actually come up, which could be, like you said, same sex losses, even women who've had abortions, mm -hmm. um, suicides. Yeah. Probably the most common one's gonna be abortions and suicides that we'll probably see in our church. How do we as pastors approach that? I think just doing a pro-life march would be the most helpful <laughs> thing. Tell women that it's terrible and, uh, yeah. and probably just convince them. 
so let, no, we'll, we're going to do the pro care side of things. But what have you picked up so far? Mm -hmm. And not just you, Benjamin. But what have you picked up so far about people are experiencing those types of losses? They know that they probably can't talk about them, or that people are super uncomfortable around it. Suicide losses really they experience that isolation because people don't know what to do. They won't even say the name of the person who died. Really isolating. So what, uh, it, what, what, what kind of things have you picked up on so far? They'll withdraw. Yeah. And so how can we help with that kind of stuff? You, you as the pastor go to them yeah. rather than waiting for them to come to you. Yeah. And you don't need to force yourself on them, yeah. but can, letting them know continually, I am here. Uh, I, even if there's no other safe place where you can talk about this, I, I will be there. <coughs> yeah, so we're being, we want to say outreach oriented. Yeah. That is, we're reaching out to them, not waiting for them to show up at our office door or whatever. Uh, being intentional about calling. This is an important thing for all losses. It is not going to be helpful for you to say, call me when you need me. It's well-intentioned, and you're not meaning to harm. They will not call you. Now, if you don't want to be called, keep saying that. It will save you a lot of work, and you can keep doing whatever you would rather be doing. Mm -hmm. But if you actually want to help them, and so, again, you can reflect on that, you are going to need to call them. Because what's happened is that they're in a place of needing to receive care, not give care or reach out. And so um, they, you, you'll need to be the one to call to initiate. And that might be three, six, nine, 12 months, that kind of thing. They're not going to call you and say, oh, this is the anniversary of the death and I'm having a really rough time. You need to call them. And so, yeah, so outreach oriented, being able to say, we can talk. I'm here for you. What else so far would you say? Don't try to rationalize it. Yeah. Okay. So, what do you mean by that? Well, I, you, you just heard so many, so many things about. Well, it was their time. Mm -hmm. Or um, God has a plan in this. Or mm. God called them back home. And, no. Just Maybe depends if you're a Calvinist or not. I, yeah. <laughs> if you're a Calvinist, I mean, they're Lutheran Calvinists, then you would say, this is part of God's plan, and so now you just need to accept his will. That's what he wrote, John, in his wisdom to the parents of a child who died. God's plan, and you can take comfort in that. So if you like that kind of thing, you can, and if you're a Calvinist, you'll do that. Yeah, so no rationalizing it. Trying to again, that's 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 approaching it through the head, but we said it's it's about love and not logic, so yeah, so not not trying to treat it or make it go away because what is what what are those attempts? It's rationalizing, but it's trying to get the person to be thankful, to get away from their grief, to to ha find a silver lining. Well, they're in a better place now. True, but not not helpful. Because you'd still rather them be here. Mm -hmm. Though, you know, what will people eventually say? But I know that if he had stayed, it was going to be rough. And so, allowing them to lead, and maybe they come to a point where they're thankful mm -hmm. and they're released. But jumping in with that, of you directing it, is not helpful mm -hmm. because then that's about you and not them. So we'll we'll touch on that some more mm -hmm. um, as we go because really. Regardless of the type of loss, there's kind of that disposition or how we approach it. Other uh, questions or reflections or comments? Okay, so I'll touch briefly on carry grief um, and then kind of look at oral hope. So, um, Carry grief is just a way of saying you don't have a prolonged grief disorder. That's, again, medical model language saying there's something wrong with you. But maybe you've not been given the room to actually authentic anymore. What's going to happen? Difficulties with trust and intimacy. People whose relationships always tank. 
And if that's you, then you just want to talk to somebody about that. Depression, negative outlook, chronic depression, you know, other, other types of stuff, anxiety attacks, panic attacks, that kind of thing. Not always, and not always does somebody have an anxiety disorder, but if they've grown up in a, in a home or experienced the kinds of things where they're always feeling like they're walking on eggshells and somebody's going to lash out at them, well, quite naturally, they've internalized the sense that you're just not safe in the world. Anxiety and panic attacks? Anxiety is just globalized fear. Fear, well, initially I had fear that driving in the car would, uh, you know, at following the accident would, would cause harm. Well, if that hardens, it can get turn into an anxiety where everything is dangerous. The whole world is dangerous and I don't feel safe. Psychic numbing is the sort of sense of not being able to emotionally engage um, and kind of disconnected. Just irritability, agitation, these kinds of things, because people will, um, you know, as, as one woman uh, said, it's like the, her, her, her emotional and pain level is, is up to here, and any little emotional experience just causes the ripples to like explode, and, it, and it's too much. Or one guy following uh, um, uh, a session at a, at a church and said, well, it's kind of like a pressure cooker and you're afraid to take the lid off because it might be too much. And so, because he learned to live with it for so long that it's frightening to consider taking it off. You will find substance abuse, addictions, eating disorders. You know, this is the work of uh, Gabor Mate in, in Vancouver where he's found that people on the, you know, addicts on the Lower East Side have, there's a strong correlation of trauma to their addiction. Why? Because they're trying to treat the pain away and you know and then there's a biochemical addiction that uh, results at times but you know what <coughs> happens and so you you know you start looking at these and then you think about the people you encounter they're going to be people kind of marginalized they probably won't be working they're going to have a hard time having a lot of social relationships in your congregation or wherever else these are people who need attention they need care if they're going to find any kind of healing. Otherwise, they're just living with that until they die. And their death is probably going to be a lot sooner than it other, otherwise it would have been. And so, kind of connected to that, then what are, what are you keeping an eye out for? Suicide survivors. Oh, when you find out that there's been a suicide death in that family, and you don't know how far back it's been, you want to you want to start connecting that to things that you're observing, patterns of behavior, relationship, other victims of abuse. Again, you're not you're not going to find the first day you show up, they're not going to say, "Oh, I just want to let you know when I was five years old, the babysitter molested me," and this kind of thing. But uh, because I've been told that uh, you know you kind of reap what you sow, I knew it was probably my fault for flirting with him, and so um, this kind of thing. She's not going to tell you that on day one. Um, but you're going to want to acknowledge or remember that that's going to be there under the surface and probably more people you recognize. People experience natural disasters, military, paramilitary, you know, car crash survivors, you know, th and those are kind of regular things, if you want to say. Um, and so there's a good chance that you've got lots of those that might be around and to kind of have your antenna. What are we doing as as we go into give hope, well, what's the difference between optimism and hope? One way of kind of doing it is say optimism is the confidence that things are going to get better. But we all know that's not always true, right? Optimism can be a little naive. It's not always going to get better. Hope is the confidence, especially as Christians, that we have a God who is with us even in the midst of this and will see us through. Situation might get worse we can get through it. Because we've got a God who enters into this with us. He doesn't shame us for experiencing this. He doesn't shame us for doubting him or wrestling and all these kinds of things or for wondering if he's even there or paid any attention on that day when your son died. But he welcomes us into that to give expression to it. And when we as pastors, you know, that's kind of that thing where we have this, you know, both uh, a great responsibility and privilege and, and sometimes an onerous one of getting to kind of communicate God to people, even through our actions, but we can communicate that 
I'm here for you, and so is God. Or God is here for you, and so am I. And we're gonna, not going to leave you alone. And that becomes really hopeful. Uh, Alan, who I do the, the work with, talks about his divine momentum. And that's, is what, what he's meaning to say is, you know, kind of going back to Kai's question, what happens when somebody's stuck? Well, we give them some, a little bit of momentum. Oh, I, I found somebody I can talk to about things. That's hope, Phil. I'm not going to be alone. I don't have to carry this all by myself for the next 35 years or however many years I've already been doing it. And so that becomes really powerful. And so, again, we're thinking about um, head, head versus heart. Grief is anchored in love and not logic. You're not going to Bible verse them out of it. You're not going to reason them into behaving properly so you don't have to deal with their strong emotions and that kind of thing. Um, but it's anchored in love, and, and so you can't reason them. And it responds to love. And this is maybe a way of then thinking about how do we help? We show love. We show that the person matters. And, th and, this, and this is where you have to do the theological reflection. Does their humanity matter? Does this person, with all of the baggage, messy baggage, all kinds of complicated stuff, matter and how much? The same? Same as me? Less? More? You know, on a basic level, we'll say, no, everybody's the same. But there's a place of then, how can we do that and consistently do that and communicate that? You matter. You matter to God and you matter to me. Um, that becomes you know, a deeply theological and profound kind of experience where we get to then, through communicating love, when people have had their love torn apart, get to kind of create the space for some healing. And so the treatment is not you know, five steps or, or different types of you know, cognitive behavioral therapy that will uh, you know, give you some practices to do, even if elements of that can be helpful. But to say, we're just facilitating giving expression to it. It actually, in, in a sense, is not really doing anything on your part. You're not the expert coming in. You're just creating room for people to talk. It's very freeing. You don't have to know the answers. You don't have to have the techniques or memorize stuff or whatever. Yes, you'll have a body of knowledge. Yes, you'll be aware of the things that go on with people, and you'll see patterns, and you'll tie it together. But you don't have to have it all uh, manage like some sort of medical expert to know all the answers off the top of your head. You can connect with them in a deep and profound way, because you can't fix it unless you're going to do a resurrection. Then, then you can fix it. You can decide, again, do personal self-reflection. Am I prepared to do that and all the fallout of what's going to happen? Or will I skip the resurrections and uh, allow them to acknowledge the truth that they already know? You can't fix it. They know you can't fix it. You know you can't fix it. So quit trying to and just be present. It's wonderfully free and a great joy and honor. All right, any Questions or reflections on this part then? We're going to pause for another five minute break. Will five minutes be okay? Mm -hmm. We'll do that, we'll come back, and then we'll kind of conclude for our next part. So we'll think, we're thinking about then how do we transfer this into pastoral care? And uh, for this part, we're going to push our tables back and kind of sit in a circle. So if you want to...